So, um, hi, I want to welcome you. My name is Lenore Reiser, and I'm a curator at the Arabidopsis Information Resource. And I'm here with my colleague, Shabri. Um, and today's topic, the last in our series for this month, is on how to make your gene function data more visible and accessible in TEAR. Um, so just some basic ground rules here for the webinar, if you haven't been to one of these before. Um, your audio and video is off by default, so if you have technical issues or you're having questions, um, put them in the chat. And of course, um, questions for the Q&A, please also put those in the chat as they come to your mind. Um, uh, we'll spend about 20-25 minutes doing the presentation and then um, we'll be able to answer your questions. The video of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days afterwards. So, um, so I'm going to start out with a quick poll, and then I'm gonna talk about what is FAIR data and why it matters. Then I'm gonna talk about um, the gene function data, how to make it visible and accessible in TEAR. We'll have another brief poll, and then we'll have time for our Q&A. So, um, Shabri is going to now launch the poll, and then there's two questions in here about what you work on and um, what types of publishable data you generate in your research. So I'll give you just a moment. Just give a few more seconds for the everybody to have a chance to chime in. All right. Oh, one more person who can vote. All right. I think we'll end the poll. So it looks like um, we have uh, people who are a uh, few people on Arabidopsis, a lot of people working in other species. Um, so most of what I'm going to talk about today is really about sharing Arabidopsis data in TEAR, but there are some sort of like generalizable rules that I think are really important for anybody publishing on plant gene function. So um, I'm going to start out talking about FAIR data, and some of you may have heard this term FAIR, but here I'm going to define it for you. So FAIR is an acronym that is used to describe data and data resources, and it means the following. So FAIR means findable, that is that data is human and machine readable and it's attached to persistent identifiers such as a DOI. Um, accessible means that the data can be found and retrieved by humans or machines using standard formats. Interoperable data can be exchanged and used between systems. So in between databases and desktop applications, between databases and so on. And then reusable data, of course, means that its data can be used, remixed, and reanalyzed by others. And so this is really where you know, the, the scientific community is trying to go with data. If you've been following a lot of the COVID research, there's been a lot of uh, work on making this COVID data fair, and that's really helped accelerate um, discovery in those areas. So why does it matter? So particularly in the context of, um, of, of TEAR and the fact that we do a lot of this um, literature-based curation, that most low throughput but very high quality experimental data that's published by researchers is not computationally accessible. It's not intrinsically fair because the data formats are variable, people write in um, non-standard ways and that's understandable. Um, even high throughput data, so you know, large data sets, maybe your RNA-seq data, when it's published particularly in supplements and lacking metadata or published in weird formats, um, that's also not fair. So when data isn't fair, it limits your ability to get answers to your questions, and it also limits other people's ability to reuse and ultimately to be able to cite your data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how data goes into databases. And if you participated in that first webinar where I gave an introduction to TEAR, I talked about curation and what makes TEAR unique is that people like me 
curate data, and that's really the process of extracting and organizing information to help you make meaning. So human curation tends to be precise but slow, and although I just said it was precise, there's also the possibility of human error or potentially even bias in curation. Now computational methods of, of curation are very high throughput, but they can also be error prone. Um, you know, if data is in weird uh, different formats, then it has to be, um, it has to be processed and, and, and fixed. And for this kind of um, low throughput, but high quality information and publications, it's just, in, it's unstructured data. So it's intrinsically not really computationally accessible. And although I think that we would like to, um, and ultimately have a goal of using perhaps artificial intelligence or machine learning to be able to or organize and digest this content, we're still quite a ways away from that. So, you know, some, we still require human intervention to get data into databases. So sort of from here on, I'm gonna talk about sort of the kinds of things that you can do when you're preparing a publication to help unlock your data, to make it more accessible through curation. And some of the things I'm gonna talk about in depth and other things I just really wanna mention. So I will talk about the importance of using um, specific identifiers for genes and other types of bio entities. It's really important to identify your biological entities in a, a publication about why, when, when and not to use um, image formats for data, um, why it's important to put your data in a long-term stable repository, the importance of metadata, sorry. And so um, this first question about the importance of gene names. Unambiguously identifying your biological entities is perhaps the, most sing the single most important thing you can do to aid in making your gene function information fair. That identifier, in this case, um, what we're calling the AGI, um, Arabidopsis Genome Initiative, um, locus identifier, this AT4G39110, is a unique address in the Arabidopsis genome for one and only one um, gene, uh, gene model, or one and only one locus. And this is really what we use in order to be able to integrate all of the different information about that locus. So this tells us, this unique gene identifier tells us exactly what gene it is that in this paper, it's describing um, B, BUPS1 and 2. This is, these are the genes that they're referring to. So this is really good. So why does it matter? Why is it really important to unambiguously identify genes? Um, so uh, we have situations a lot of the times where we have one name, that goes to many genes. And when I'm talking about a name, I'm talking about these common sort of gene symbols that we tend to use when, um, when we're publishing, right? You know, we don't uh, often talk about our genes using these AGI locus IDs. These are like the mnemonic gene names that carry meaning. But um, when we're trying to do, use automated methods of making associations, using these symbolic names can lead to a lot lack of specificity. So if you do a search and tear for the gene name or the gene symbol CCR1, there's actually four distinct loci that have all been assigned this gene symbol by various people in publications. So you'll get a lot of spurious information. Um, there's the other, the sort of converse is that you, have, you can have a situation where you have one gene that's referred to by many names. So this is actually um, from a relatively recent publication describing these two different unique um, loci in Arabidopsis that have been given these um, names, ULP2 like two and ULP2 like one. Okay, so we have the locus identifier and the names and also some history that apparently previously had been published under a different name. So we can use those two different names to find information about these loci. Unfortunately, the authors then went and gave it a third name. So, you know, this is a really not ideal situation. And if we're not aware of all the different names for this gene, then we're going to lose information in a search. These identifiers are also really important because they help us to resolve confusion over species. So if we only include a symbolic name and, out, and without any information about the species, which is um, being described, so this Tor kinase, there's nothing in the title or abstract for this paper that actually tell, told us whether it was referring to an Arabidopsis gene, a maize gene, or possibly even a human gene. 
So it's really important to use those systematic locus identifiers, whether it's for tear or any other species. All right, so um, I said another thing that's really important, which is that picture formats should be reserved for pictures. So sometimes people put this very important gene identifying information in strange places in, in papers where it's not computationally accessible. And this is an example of a paper that I was curating where the only information about the um, specific locus um, for Arabidopsis or for any of the other genes described in this phylogenetic analysis was in a phylogenetic tree image figure in a PDF format. And so you can't parse that information out. Um, similarly, there was also um, sequence reported and sequences that are reported in papers and not submitted into GenBank or Anvil or anywhere else is also not fair. So um, I've also seen many situations where people produce tables and then they take those nice tables and they put them into a PDF and it's, or, or a JPEG and you just can't parse that information. So bottom line is when you're preparing your data um, for publication, that um, data in image formats is not findable or accessible. And so if it has tabular data, if it has sequences, leave it in tables. If you've got gene identifiers, Put them in the text of your paper, or, you know, either in line or in a particular um, section in your methods. So now I'm going to talk about um, gene function data and submitting that data to TEAR. Um, all right, so what are the kinds of things that you can submit to TEAR? So we have, um, uh, we take gene names, um, and by that I mean the symbols. If you need to uh, get a systematic locus identifier, we will assign those. Um, we accept gene ontology and plant ontology annotations. And if you were at um, Tanya's webinar, the last um, or the previous webinar in the series, you talked a lot about that. Um, we accept gene summaries. So you are experts in the functions and information about these genes. And so if you have summaries to share, we can accept that. Um, information about alleles and phenotypes, references, and there are other types of data at that end. I won't go into all of these different examples, but if you have other types of data, we encourage you to ask us. And if we don't accept it, we can tell you where it probably should go. All right, so if you want to submit data to TEAR, where do you go ahead and start? If you're on any of the TEAR page, you, pages, you'll see a section for submit. Um, so you would go to the submit section and you'll see all the different um, submission um, links. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, the example of submitting a gene name. So before you publish, um, when you even first discover some interesting genes, you can uh, reserve a gene symbol. So TEAR is one of uh, the plant genome databases that actually maintains a nomenclature database. Maze, GDB is another place where you can, um, uh, where you can work with them on nomenclature. So we have a gene symbol registry you can access through multiple different sites. You can browse to see what gene symbols have been registered. So before you name something, check and see whether or not that symbolic name is in use. Sometimes genes are not in the registry. So what I would then do is I would also do perform a search and tear and search in PubMed or Google Scholar. So before you go and name a gene, then one, you know, look around and make sure that that symbol isn't um, in use. And then you can go ahead and register and use it. So another very important piece of information is gene ontology and plant ontology annotations. And these are really ways of making your gene function information um, accessible computationally because it codifies that experimental data in the form of these annotations. So if you, and if you've published in journals like Plant Cell, Plant Physiology, um, uh, uh, a plant journal, you might have been contacted by us at TEAR and asked to submit your gene function data and then directed to this page where you can um, submit your uh, gene ontology and plant ontology annotations. And so if you've just, if you have a paper where you're just describing, you know, one or two genes, you might want to fill out this form, or there's also a pre-formatted spreadsheet if you have information for a lot of different genes. And the really important thing to bear in mind is this kind of community creation is essentially a way of fast tracking your paper. So we have to go through hundreds of papers every year 
and we have a triage system in place um, for, for what we'll get to. So if you do this community creation, that will sort of bump your paper up to the top of the list. So it really speeds up the integration of your data and its accessibility and tear. So if you go, let's say, and, and, you, and you go to this form, um, we have a, a tool called Toast, and you'll be asked to provide the unique identifier for, the, for your publication. So you start with the reference we curate based upon um, papers. Um, you can add information. So you'll be asked to identify the genes in the paper, and then you could add information about the names. And then there's a section for adding the Go annotation, so annotations to function, process, and localization. There's a section to add plant ontology annotations, so um, for gene expression. You can also um, add protein interactions, so generally these are protein binding. And all the way down at the bottom of the form, there's a place where you can provide unstructured summary information. And just as a quick reminder, for, for one of these Go annotations, a Go annotation is an assertion about a function. So in this case, this is an assertion about this gene product, uh, CYPK25, being involved in this um, uh, biological process of cellular potassium ion homeostasis. So you'll be asked to provide your gene name choose a, an aspect of the ontology by process um, function or component, identify a keyword, right? So find, find the term, the appropriate term. And then you're gonna be asked to um, indicate what experiment in that paper provides the evidence to support this assertion. Um, and then you, you know, you'll see here in the annotation that the, the citation um, is included in it. So, um, if you're using the form, you know, you'll see you start typing in a, a word and you'll get a bunch of auto-suggested terms. But if you're using the spreadsheet, you'll have to go and find the term. And I'd like to use um, the Amigo browser, which is the ontology browser that's produced by the Gene Ontology Consortium. And you can go there and you can type in a term. So like, okay, is chloroplast the term that I want to use? You can type it in there. You can see a detail page where you get um, a definition for that term. So make sure that it actually is describing what it is that you think it is. And then because we'd like to use the most precise term as possible, um, one of the nice things about this tool is that you can go to something called the inferred tree view that enables you to look at the um, ancestors and descendants of this term. So you can see if there's a more precise term. So if your data suggests that not only is this protein localized to the chloroplast, but specifically to the chloroplast thylakoid, then you would want to use chloroplast thylakoid as your term. And this is just a nice way of drilling down to find precise terminology. So um, there are other, again, I said there's other types of data that you can provide. We have um, spreadsheets available for submitting like allele and, and phenotype information. Um, we also have these uh, more informal kinds of ways. So for every one of our detail pages in TEAR, there is a community comment section. So if you register at TEAR, you can log in and you can add a comment. This is the way a lot of people let us know that like, oh, I was looking at the publications and I noticed that something was missing. So you know, people can, um, can suggest that we add it, right? So the add comments here. And then there's always the ability to send us an email to contact us directly. And we definitely encourage that if you have questions about data sets. So what happens after you submit your data? It gets reviewed by a curator and we might approve it as is and then it just goes through. We might make some modifications. So oftentimes with the gene ontology annotations, we might modify the terms or the evidence depending on what we see in the paper. Um, we may contact you and ask you questions to clarify. Um, once that um, submission has been uh, reviewed and accepted, that that curated data then goes into TEAR on a weekly basis, and the uh, gene ontology annotations also get exported on a quarterly basis, so those get made freely available um, every quarter. And then there's always an attribution. So at, when I showed you that example of the gene ontology annotation, you could see that there was an uh, association not only to the paper, but there's also an attribution to you for submitting. And then, you know, when we include the summaries and the alleles and phenotypes, we also include a link so that, you know, that goes back to your um, publication. 
so um, sort of reminding you what I said about earlier is that it's important to think about these things as you're preparing your manuscript to, to make your data more fair. So, you know, including these um, uh, locus identifiers, specifying your bio entities, and, you know, if it's a Arabidopsis, use the AGI locus ID. If it's another uh, organism, use a uniprote or RNA central ID, or whatever is the appropriate nomenclature for your species. Same thing with stocks, you know, to ensure reproducibility, you should always donate your stocks. Um, data and tables should stay in tables. Um, if you're putting your data into a repository uh, and you're not sure where it should go and there aren't instructions from the journal, you can ask us and we'll try to help you. It's always important to include metadata. So metadata is data about your data so that people can understand how to use the data. Um, and the best time to think about the metadata is as you're doing experiments and to collect as much of it as you possibly can. And as always, you know, if you have questions about how to handle your data, um, even if you're thinking about how to handle something when you're preparing a grant, we encourage you to contact us or, you know, if this is for another plant species and there is a curator at the end of that database, you should contact them. So, um, more a couple of more resources so we have a little bit more information about you know go annotations more detail about that if you'd like to know more and a tutorial on using the software for submitting go annotations to tear um, there is a tip sheet so i covered some of our sort of like top 10 things that you should do for making your published data more fair but we have a tip sheet online that you can um, review as well and I, i'm gonna say it again email us with questions so I'm gonna um, ask you two more questions in a final poll before we go on to answering your questions. 